What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm here at the Saga, and uh, it's time for the Dave episode number two. And by the Dave episode, I'm talking Dave Himmel. Last week, we posted just a teaser for our special collaboration that we did with Dave. But this week, we have the full two-hour chat. We go very, very deep into his brain, the world of uh, fashion, the history of fashion in North America, the history of blanket jackets, the history of leather, his adventures up north into the Canadian wild wilderness. Um, it's a really fun episode, and the knowledge you're going to hear in this one is beyond belief. It's just, he drops all kinds of gems. He's a super intelligent man, and I'm stoked to have him on the show. A couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, yeah, make sure you go download the Easy app if you want to sell live or if you want to buy stuff on there. Go check out the Easy app, as always. If you want to shop F is in Frank Vintage.com, there's a link down below. There's even a code down there. Also, I don't really talk about this much, but Frankie Collective, I'm currently the COO of Frankie Collective, and you guys got to check it out. We are reworking hundreds of items weekly, dropping crazy amounts of product on FrankieCollective.com. We do now have unisex reworks on there, plus lots for the ladies. Um, so go check that out. And uh, without further ado, let's just jump into this episode with Dave Himmel of Himmel Bros Leather. Dave, it's just you and me now, buddy. Nice. One on one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's go. Uh, okay. So, again, if you want those jackets, they're at inspiration. And uh, you can hit us up if you really need one and we'll try to accommodate. But we're going to be showing that inspiration is this Friday and Saturday coming up here. Pasadena. But we want to throw in Pasadena, California. And what, what are the dates? Seventh and eighth? Yeah. Just before the Rose Bowl. Seventh and eighth. Yeah. yeah. Which we'll get into kind of inspiration talk, but if you've never heard of inspiration, it is a major vintage nerd event. It has all the best dealers from around the country and international showing off things that they've hoarded and saved and just amazing pieces. And, and everybody some new tries fashion to brands, like, right? I think. Yeah. Yep. Double RL's there. Yep. You've been there in the past. Yep. There's other cool design and there's like surfy skate brands sometimes yep. come. So it's a good mix. Um, yeah, and you just get to hang out with everyone in the scene and, and chat and have a good time. Try and experience West Coast life as we all don't have. Well, I don't have it. You're a West Coast guy. I'm uptight, yeah. stressed out, trying not to smoke, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, come out West and, and loosen up. <laughs> what? Loosen up. Mm, let, yeah. let loose on the beach for a weekend and have fun. Yeah, we'll try. <laughs> Okay, so I want to I want to throw it back to the beginning with you um, and learn about how you began in the vintage world in the first place. That's uh, wow, that's way back. Uh, that would be ninety two, and uh, nice. I was a little baby Hibble, trying to be surviving artist guy. You know, I have a <laughs> very complicated work history. And I'm not going to go into that because no one wants to hear about the 1,200 Himmels that came before vintage Himmel. But uh, I was in the Sneaky D's, my local bar that I worked at, renovated at, made t-shirts for, and uh, a buddy walked in. And uh, we were having brunch, and he said, Hey, Himmel, do you know where I can get some used 501 jeans? And I'm like, why? And he's like, well, I'll pay you 25 US a pair. And I was like, well, that's a challenge. And uh, I immediately went into my network 
and located a little place called I think you may have heard of them back in the day. And uh, so we're going to we're going to we're going to bleep we're going to bleep that one out. But yeah, oh, we'll just are say, they yeah, still we'll a just business? Call you, okay. fa- you found a su- you found a supplier. All right, all right, all right, all right. Sorry, I'll uh, I'll keep the names. I'll keep the names out of it. Uh, yeah, we can go vague on the names. I I I found a a, a, a rag house where and uh, picked up like a hundred pairs of Levi's five hundred ones for. I think I paid. For four bucks three bucks a pair and I, and i got paid like 30 bucks canadian a pair and i was like whoa man this is better than drug deal <laughs> like some kind of <laughs> magic money here so that's uh that's how i got into it uh where i landed from it is a whole nother spot in a whole nother place yeah so, like many it started with denim yeah like like almost all the ogs it started with denim and it's funny that you say sneaky d's because I still see that you're frequenting that spot. Well, that, and that's so you know, yeah. yeah, I didn't know it was there. Well, way it's back. slated so to be like everything in Toronto. It. It's slated to become a condo in the next four years. So uh, I suspect they're moving. But like, uh, I go, I've had every birthday there for like thirty years. So you know, wow. It's uh, I like to call it Sneaky D's, the dysfunctional family restaurant, and that's that's basically my family location for uh my youth and then my 30s and my 40s and now my 50s so yay <laughs> anyway i love the place well hopefully hopefully it sticks around for a little longer here because i you're i know you know i want to kind of get into old toronto too on this talk because i know you're you reside in kensington market which kensington market is renowned for vintage Probably like in in Canada, everybody knows Kensington Market as this hub, this kind of neighborhood that had turned into retail and and still is like houses that are converted to stores, a lot of it, right? Yeah. And it's been there forever. You live there and it's kind of changing rapidly, just as most of Toronto is and most cities around North America are changing super fast, you know, but hearing your, your story where you've actually were there back in 92 i can understand uh how that makes you feel now a little different is are you asking a question because i'm curious yeah well what, i do want to know, do you I know, know about the k-town i i could give you my thoughts I, I know let's get into that let's get into toronto in the early days so you you've now found the found the rag house you're in vintage um, was Kensington Market there in those days and like okay so how was your business running back in the early days Kensington Market is known as the Jewish market, right? And you you can appreciate that. Even anybody over 60 doesn't call it Kensian market. They call it the Jewish market. And that's where everybody used to go to get their their foods, stuffs. There were jobbers. There was a bakery. I can tell you my first time in Kensington market was with my booby. My second time, I was 11 years old. I was there with my a uh, hippie alternative school math teacher, Michael Levy, and we went down to uh, Casa Abril in Portugal, which is now known as Amadeus's, and I had a Coke, and he had lunch there. You know, so it's an incredible, beautiful... It was a place... It was a place where if you were an immigrant and you wanted to start a business, it it, it had small retail shops and houses, and it had this beautiful neighborhood character to it sometimes a little dangerous sometimes a little crazy there were many many after hours spots there were bars that opened and closed but like all things all good things must be destroyed by developers in Toronto who need to make money and uh, destroy the very value that they're trying to sell which is hey come move to a cool neighborhood we're gonna flatten the cool part and build this crap texture that you can live in like a rat in a cube or just invest it. So like all things in Toronto, uh, that has accelerated and that beautiful neighborhood is under threat. Now, when I moved down here and I'm still in the same place that I moved down to in 1990, um, it was vintage clothing stores, punk rockers, uh, there was one decent restaurant and everything else was ethnic food. 
you know, Portuguese yeah. rotisserie chicken places, grocery stores, fruit stores, butcher shop. And this is for me walking around in a neighborhood where everybody knows me and says hi to me or hates me is my friend of me, my enemy, my friend, my ex lover. This is my fantasy world, right? I want to be in this ever dynamic universe where I can't escape from myself. So, so that, that's, uh, Kenzie to market. It's not this corporate glass box culture where no one ever talks to anyone and you're just, you know, going home, stressing out whether or not you can pay your mortgage and then, uh, leave to work and then return back to your in-house gym and Instagram world. That's how my world, my world is full of rats and markets and dirt yeah, and filth like and being people. out there yeah. with the people, yeah. the, and, the, and all the things that that comes with, man. And I, and I see it in you. Yeah. So that's Kensington and those vintage shops. Those are a long tradition. That's a long, long tradition of Jewish heritage meets uh, hippie heritage that meets fashion, right? And I mean, we could trace that back, but if I were to give it like a, a real quick synopsis, when my grandparents came here and they didn't speak English and there were no, there was no work. My grandfather worked in a schmata, a sewing factory, a schmata factory as a steam presser. And my grandmother collected old rags and fixed them and sold them. And they lived above a store on Queen Street. That was called the rag, rag trade, rag and bones, right? You run around, bones for glue, rags for repair or for sale. And that's where rag and bones comes from. It's, it's, uh, uh you know, the Jewish schmata trade. So before... In Europe, the only skills that people had, Jews were very limited in their shtetls. They weren't allowed to do a lot. So they, they weren't allowed to leave. They weren't allowed to own land. So they learned skills. And one of those skills was sewing and sewing. The sewing machine was Adler. It was Singer. These are patents combined by Jewish guys to build sewing machines. And predominantly it was a very Jewish dominated business and Kansas market. I, yeah. I, well, I was just saying, I learned that recently, like you're saying, like there was only certain jobs available to certain pe certain religions and certain class yeah. uh, structures, right? Yeah. Like you're saying for the Jews, like you couldn't uh, do certain professions. And th so they had to find professions that they could do. And I believe like, you know, there's the whole Jews became bankers. They were like brought in to be bankers by by some other religion, I believe, because that religion, it, they couldn't lend money. It was against their religion. Well, the, so they were like, the, the Catholic Jews Church banned money lending. And the Burgones, I mean, I may be wrong on this because I'm not a 100% right. expert um, on everything. And there is Wikipedia and chat GPT now. So, but the <laughs> Dutch who really invented banking, there was, you know, they used to call Amsterdam, the nickname for Amsterdam was Moken, which is like Yiddish for town. Like um, it was called Moken. And it, they had a huge Jewish population, and I believe that stemmed back from uh, their development of the banking industry and also the Burgundians. I think they were uh, uh, not really pro-Catholic church, so you could bring in, you needed uh, people that weren't going to be subjected to the, uh, the, the rules of the church, and certainly Jews in Europe fell under that uh, umbrella, of course, not always because... You know, we had this little thing called the Inquisition and various other, other, uh, um, uh, mini, uh, holocausts, if you will. Uh, but, uh, definitely, uh, a lot of that came out of that Catholic church banning of money lending, right? So, uh, I, I believe in Islam, so, yeah. you can't money lend either. So it was like a double set, double whammy of, uh. And, you know, you want to fight a good war, as we know, everybody needs to borrow money. I think we've all seen Game of Thrones, right? So just says instead, instead of talking about modern wars, we get to talk about Game of Thrones. You know, we have to go borrow the money to fight our cousin anyway. So uh, got to get it from somewhere. So the Ju the, Ju the Jews of the Garbentos back to Kensington Market and yeah. how that developed into the, the rag world that it yeah, is. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, your dad was a big part of this, but... Uh, you know, the original formation of the clothing industry was this rag and bones, right? And 
one of the benefits I, I feel like uh, my grandparents, for example, spoke multitudes of languages. They, they spoke Yiddish, which is German, so they could speak German. They spoke Slavic languages. My, my grandfather was from Poland. My grandmother was from Ukraine, from Kiev. They got married on the steps of the synagogue in Kensington. That's like, I'm telling you, this is like the locus of of the Jewish community, which is now being flattened by the Jewish community in, in development. But anyway, uh, they spoke Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, uh, all of the Slavic languages associated with that. And in a lot of cases, if they were European Jews, central European Jews of Italian or, or Dutch, they, you got the German, you got the Dutch, you, you would then have Italian. So if you were going to uh, hire immigrants and work uh, and employ people who didn't speak English, that was a definite advantage if you were running a sewing factory, right? And um, uh, sewing was cons not considered uh, high quality work, like much like Hollywood was not considered high quality work. So wherever you see these low quality uh, industries, you would see a lot of immigrant Jews sort of move in and become dominant in these industries that what we would call the white people didn't want to do. Right. And, uh, yeah, the offshoot of that rag collection was the rag trade, which was the business of collecting old clothing, cutting it up and selling it for rags and wipers, which is what you would need if you were a car mechanic shop or an industrial pollute producer and you needed something cheap to clean up spills, oil, <coughs> paint, you could go buy uh, cut up fabric, uh, uh, called, uh, wipers. And those came from the rags. Yep. And then of course you see this industrialization of the rag business in the sixties and the seventies where these factories would form and take all the leftover clothing collected from the Goodwill, the Salvation Army, all these uh, charitable organizations, and then process them into rags and wipers. So wearable clothes versus unwearable clothes. And half of it would go into wipers or uh, if it was wool chopped up and turned into, you, into car insulating door panels or, you know, industri industrial use. And the other half would go into... Uh, uh, export to other countries for wearable clothing. And therein comes the modern vintage clothing business, which is intercepting, as you know, you've been doing this a long time, intercepting the great vintage clothing from that. But I would say that Kensington Market grew up around Courage My Love and Exile Clothing, these sort of hippies from the 60s that would repurpose uh, denim and old military stuff and open stores and sell that. So, you know, my first coat back when I was a mod was like a trench coat, a wool trench coat. And I got it at a double breasted, double wool coat that I got at exile, you know, in the early eighties. And then I got myself, a uh, a, a fishtail parka, you know, cause I saw Quadrophenia and I had to have a fishtail parka, right? So, yeah. you know, so, and that generation was the generation that predated me. Those guys were boomers like your dad, who they all kind of knew each other at rock festivals and they all kind of knew each other from the communes and the, and the lifestyle in Yorkville. And it married those rag houses and that hippie tradition and clothing stores. So you see the neighborhoods of Yorkville, you see, uh, Baldwin village, you see Kensington market. These were all like places where black Panthers, hippies, left wing activists and vintage clothing stores all sort of spawned in the sixties and the seventies. And that's the Kensington market that I moved into in the late eighties, early nineties. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what I would have gone there. You know, I was a kid, my parents would take us down there because I was born in Toronto, but we lived in Niagara. But every trip to the city, we would go walk the market. And it was, yeah, it was that's magical, what I right? remember. It, it had from, such a nice vibe. It was, it was mid-80s, like, yeah. It wasn't like, oh, I can't afford to live here anymore. And everything's an Airbnb. It was like, wow, why is this place allowed to exist? And why are people so cool? That's, that, that was yeah. the vibe, and it was, right? 
It was you go there on the weekend. It's packed with people. Again, you have these houses that are converted to stores. So people would fill the front yards with racks of clothing and like really amazing signage and um, color everywhere because you have all the clothes and then people like de- doing up their stores to stand out in the market differently. And uh, and then, then, yeah, as you get down deeper in the market, like you're saying, it still had a lot of food and like more proper retails, but eclectic little coffee shops and different food places and i mean you know it a lot more than me but it was this magical place and i remember visiting it fondly in you know those early times it's it's really interesting to me because kensington really especially canadian vintage clothing is much more oriented towards women than men that's the first thing that's interesting to me but the canadian vintage clothing business you mean like our retail yeah, the business retail. or just the yeah. whole it- the retail okay right and yeah and the um the model is very different from the American model, right? Like until I started going down to California, I didn't realize that American vintage clothing dealers like get their stuff from like kicking in dust bowl barn doors and, and swap meets, you know, because all I ever saw was the inside of a rag house, like a, 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 a processing factory, but that was not the dominant way that people would get stuff in the States. They would, they would, pick it literally going around you know swap meets charity stores uh antique malls and like old buildings whereas here you know i spent a good part of my youth inside these giant industrial factories going through mounds and mounds of clothes and that uh is another unique to toronto sort of story because you know, those factories were all Jewish owned originally. And then in the seventies, when Idi Amin came to power in Africa and Uganda, Tanzania, the marginalized group of Ismalis, you know, uh, East African Indians, uh, were kicked out. And because of our open door Trudeau immigration policy, a lot of that community ended up in Toronto. And like many things, the Ismalis, they're, they're, they're like the Jews of Islam by other Muslims. I find that funny. I've heard that expression. Would buy, no you know, bought one clothing factory, you know, rag factory. And the next thing you know, all the rag factories in Toronto, 50, 60 of them, three quarters of them are were owned by the Ismali community. So it's like this magical mix of migration of a first group and then a migration of a second group and then them expanding that industry because no one wanted to do that industry it was considered like low work and uh then you see an explosion in vintage clothing coming out of toronto like toronto was probably supplying half of the best pieces in the vintage world in the 90s there's no question in my mind uh, about that between you know 93 and uh and maybe 2003, I know Daytona, which was a big Japanese brand, they still exist under another name, but they, they main headquarters was in Toronto. And in fact, uh, now Akimoto that runs inspiration used to work in a factory here with me. That's how we know each other. We were young men breaking our backs, going through rags in, in Toronto in the nineties. So, you know, it all ties no in, way. in a beautiful little narrative, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, there is a rag houses all over the place in America, but there's not such a big concentration center for yeah. it. Like, like, yeah, like Toronto yeah. and you're right. Like LA doesn't have it. Um, you know, there's only a few places in America that have it and they're not, they're not big centers like Toronto are. Um, and it, it is unique to Toronto, you know, and I think, um, that's a cool story to tell. And as you're saying, like these immigrants come and they, and they get in this business. And I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of it is they start with the source, right? So they come over because they know who they can ship it to. Yeah, back home they were selling. They were the sellers that way. back in East Africa. Yeah, and so now their yeah. cousins selling and they're processing here, right? So you know, in the market, that's the whole power of the business is like having the customers and being able to sell all the regular stuff. Vintage is not even a blip in the in the in the world of rags. No, really, it's a, it's a nothing. You know, it's, it's a it's it's a, it's, it's a nothing. It's your allowance. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, it's pocket money. It's money to go get go dinner on a Friday night with your family. But the rest of the money was coming from these export containers all over the world. Yeah. And, um, 
Yeah, it's very, very It's fascinating, too, because the Toronto rag community basically built the Brownsville rag community and the Houston rag community. They were they just sent cousins down and opened up all the places down there. So you can kind of track it out from Toronto to Texas and then uh, reopened a whole bunch of factories in Pakistan and India for a while as well. So the Toronto engine, economic engine of that used clothing market spawned concentrations in that market in other places, right? Um, which is kind I didn't of know fascinating. That piece of it. What's that? I didn't know that piece. I didn't know that it, it was first here. Oh, yeah. And it's fascinating because you see this, I mean, this is a total side note, side piece, but like when the Chinese cheap clothing explosion happened, the rag guys were facing competition in Africa with Chinese made garmento, right? If you can imagine. Because, the, because of a price point. Because of the yeah. price point. They were like, I can't believe this, but I can't sell my used t-shirts in the markets of East Africa because there's brand new t-shirts coming in from China. But one of the incredible ironies of that, and this was, there was a brief period in the 2000s, it was a, hilarious for me hearing about uh, rag owners complaining that they can't outcompete brand new stuff from China. And uh, I said, don't worry about it. Six months from now, they'll be buying your vintage shirts again. He's like, how do you know? I said, because those Chinese stuff they're dumping in Africa is so low quality. Even your African people are going to be like, just sell me the used stuff again. And sure enough, within like six months, even in Africa, they were like, I am not, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter if the shirt's a dollar or 50 cents, if you wear it and it disintegrates after 10 minutes, it's, it's worth nothing. Totally. Straight back to the vintage clothing produced in America, in, in Canada, in the heyday of clothing manufacture, which is like everything before 1995, right? So the quality of that clothing yeah, and, is so high, and you know? And, and and so all rag predating that period would have been high quality, like yeah. you're saying, because the shit quality started during that China boom. Yeah. So like even the regular bales were coming in, at least the clothing was quality. It was quality a lot stuff. Of it it wasn't fast America, fashion like Canada. stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because now the bales are full of fast fashion. And, and that fast fashion stuff is objectively terrible. And, 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 and there's a reason it's objectively terrible. You cannot manufacture at that price with high quality materials, high quality sewing. You have to imagine these old factories, people were, uh, uh, you know, they were trying to accelerate the human being sewing to its maximum potential, but they, they also still had to sell a high quality garment, right? Cause they had to compete with other people selling high quality garments, but the fast fashion world, there's no competition. They own the shops, yeah. they own the distribution, they own, or they, they contract out the manufacturing to such a level that it's literally all you own is the IP and the marketing. And if you can convince people or if people have nowhere else to buy things, or it's so cheap that they could just replace it in three weeks, then that's a win for those organizations. But for guys like me. A win is I could buy something, it looks cool, and I could keep it for the rest of my life and wear it out, right? Like that's, that's to me what always was the purpose of consuming was that world of, oh my God, I made, I bought this amazing thing and I had it for 20 years. Now, you know, it's a different, it's a different model. Now what's no, cool sure. is whatever's and cool this week, right? You know? Yeah, and people people need to realize it. it's a good topic you brought up, you know, because that circles back to the hit word sustainability, right? Buy something that's going to last for your whole life instead of a hundred shit things that you throw away, no matter how cheap they are, right? Like your quality jacket, it's hard to see from this video probably, but they're insanely high quality. They're made in Toronto all the details are made to last. Like in, in a hundred years, those jackets will still be around. They'll have great patina. They'll hold up and somebody else will be able to enjoy them. There are, you know, and, you and know high quality manufacturers in every country on the planet, but they don't fit the corporate model, right? And the arbitrage yeah. between 
that labor and that quality is a very interesting and dynamic question, right? So like, I can't, I can, I can tell you there are incredibly high end Chinese manufacturers that do beautiful work, for example, right? But that's not what you're getting at Canadian corporate chain store, right? And, and, and that's not the model that people are buying into when they're, and I'm going to not no. name companies, but when they're buying that fast fashion, we could just call it fast fashion and everybody knows yeah. the various companies. And when right? you do, when you do, when you go over to China and you get high quality manufacturing, it's not pennies. It's not, oh, no, cheap. it's not cheap. You, you pay it's big not money. Cheap. You got to pay it's for it. It's not cheap at all. Yeah. And China, China overall is raising prices because they know they have this stronghold on the whole world for production. Yeah. So now they're like, we own all the production. We can slowly squeeze everybody and raise all our prices because we plan this monopoly of well, I manufacturing. Mean, is it is it a plan or is it just a reality that people are demanding higher wages and there's higher costs associated and the government probably is cracking down on pollution? You can't just dump all your cuttings into the yeah. local river and whatever, you know? So I don't know what fuels that uh, uh, equation, but what I do know is that my value proposition, what I do over here, is my knowledge of design, my knowledge of history, my knowledge of pattern making and creation, and the bespoke element, right? Like, I, if I could find someone to help me make a mainline, more price-accessible uh, <laughs> line for people of what I do, and I am looking... I will work with that person, whether they be in America or Mexico or wherever, uh, Portugal, I'm exploring Portugal at the moment. And the reason is one, my IP gets copied by every other leather jacket brand. I don't know how this has happened, but I'm a tiny little design creative guy and, and yeah. you know, I, I make one jacket. And next thing you know, there's four companies making a similar jacket, you know, three years out, uh, and they're making 5,000 of them, right? Like I guarantee you our little blanket collaboration here, and I've been making these sort of blanket leather combos, uh, uh, since I started basically in 2012, I think I did my first one. I guarantee you, you'll see like three brands within six months or 2024 <laughs> launch some sort of like, yeah. uh, you know, blanket, blanket jacket thing. And I'm not yeah, talking I mean, about you're brands wearing I'm one res- right now, you know, right? You know, yeah. yeah. And I think, I think it's tough because you are making these bespoke uh, creations and you're making a pattern. There's so much development that goes into it that you're not just like, on to the next one every three months. No, my intention is to stay with the same models forever. Right. And just change the materials. You know, we have, I, I designed a lot of really interesting stuff, but in, unless you can bring it out and sell enough quantity of it to release it, it literally just gets replicated by someone else very quickly because there's the the internet. The cost of your production. Yeah. The cost of your research and and um, development could be similar to a billion dollar corporation. Oh, it's the exact same. Yeah. That's the insane exact part. same. It's the exact so same. That's the insane In part. Fact, so you're... it's probably higher for me because they use software <laughs> yeah. and all sorts of like shortcuts and 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 just jam stuff out, right? Whereas I have to do everything like manually, and which makes it different, by the way. Like you know, we draw our patterns and we. We adjust them as we go along. I'm still adjusting patterns that I've designed, you know, for fit and and design and construction. But what I find interesting, especially in in and I'm going to bring it back to these jackets that we did, right? Like it's this blanket coat goes back to the formation of clothing in North America, right to the root, right? Like this is like the root of the clothing business. So, and what I mean by that is, and the, these jackets are basically a version, the Canuck is version of like a Mackinac jacket, right? And, uh, the polo fabric is an homage to 
native trade blankets, native pattern, or like maybe we could say like Pendleton or, or trade blankets, right? And trade yep. blankets go back to Hudson's Bay and Hudson's Bay goes back to the roots of the fur trade. So as a good example, like, and this is a good story and you'll appreciate this, right? I love where we're going with this. And I want to say the fur trade prelude here is what, what was the foundation of North America? That's why people came here is to get the furs That's and right. bring them back to Europe. That's right. So yeah, at one point, Hudson's Bay owned like one third of North America, like actually Northwest Trading Co. and Hudson's Bay, they own the whole, the whole thing. They were given it by the British and the yeah. way that they got those beaver pelts was they assigned a value to, uh, trade items. And, you know, one pelt was worth this much of a blanket or this much of a gun or this much of a ax. And the trade blanket came out of, uh, the British Hudson's Bay blanket, which I believe they were originally weaved, uh, woven in, uh, France and then later in England. And, uh, you know, they had like three point, four point, you know, that was the weight and the size of the blanket. So those were literally currency for those beaver pelts. And that is a story of the beginnings of the North American clothing industry because, and I don't know if you know this, for example, Filson started out of a woolen mill, right? Um, okay. There was a, a woolen mill. I, I probably, I I have the names top of my head, but, uh, they were weaving blankets and then Filson started making blanket coats. Uh, White Stag started out of a woolen mill. Okay. Uh, Hirsch and Weiss with White Stag started yep. out of Seattle woolen mills, just like Seattle Sport Togs, the leather brand. Seattle woolen mills spawned so many brands out of its wool production. Some of them they owned, and some of them were adjacent, wool blanket adjacent. And you see this explosion of woolen mills in the 1890s, like in... Lachine, Quebec, Ayers Woolen Mills, they made like the equivalent of a Hudson's Bay blanket, 1890. They're one of the earliest, you know, you see, you see, uh, uh, industrial woolen mills suddenly appearing, producing wool and why and for what, right? But the blanket coat started in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. That's actually St. Joe's Island, which is this island sandwiched between America and Canada just uh, half an hour east of Sault Ste. Marie. Now I go deer hunting and bird hunting and fishing up on St. Joe's Island every year and Sault Ste. Marie. This is a magical spot and uh, Canada, the British yeah, Empire. And this is, we're talking, we're talking, it's like a 15 hour drive north, uh, or an hour drive north of eight, Toronto. Eight, but it's where, eight it's hour where drive Lake Toronto. Superior and Lake Huron meet on the St. Mary's River. A little short river. Yeah. Okay. So it's quite it's quite remote and beautiful. Oh, area. it's remote and beautiful. The closest American town is Sioux, Michigan, across the river. And then St. Joe's Island is right in the middle. And there was a fort there called Fort St. Joseph. So Canada, the British colony, was defined by a series of forts, right? And it's Anguishine, Fort York in Toronto, Fort Detroit, uh, Fort Michigan, Fort Niagara. What's that? Fort Niagara. Fort Niagara, right? So all these British outposts, military posts, uh, Fort uh, I, Mackinac, Michelin Mackinac. It was uh, Turtle Island in, in the original indigenous language where uh, uh, in Michigan, okay? And um, in St. Joe's, uh, the British would issue wool coats, tunics, called, uh, uh, for their soldiers, but they weren't very warm. And, uh, the commander of St. Joe's, uh, uh, the fort, uh, wanted to get some better wool coats to defend uh, the border from the increasing aggression of the Americans. Uh, but none arrived. So he requisitioned, uh, uh, that he could make coats great. They were called great coats, which are these long, you know, floor to ceiling, uh, wool coats from, uh, trade blankets. 
And uh, there was a Métis fellow uh, on St. Joe's, and they sewed up all these coats from Hudson's Bay trade blankets in red check, what we now call buffalo check, and blue. They didn't have enough blue. He wanted blue coats. They ran out. So not unlike your shirt you're wearing there, the buffalo check red and black blankets were used, and uh, they were stellar. I don't know if you know, but it's damn cold up in Sault Ste. Marie. And oh, yeah. uh, this is in 1808. So that's the invention of the blanket coat. Now, in 1812, the men of St. Joe's march south and defeat the Americans, uh, Fort Mackinac, and uh, they needed shorter length blanket coats because those long ones get caught up in the snow because they're so long. So they turned yeah, them out. Not good for going to battle. That's right. So they started making Hudson's Bay blanket coats double-breasted, you know, shawl collar, double-breasted. And you see these in paintings in the at the art gallery, the Thompson collection. Everybody's wearing Hudson's Bay coats all across Canada at this point. These guys make this double-breasted jacket. They take back the fort and they named the coat after the fort, the Mackinac jacket from the fort, right? I fucking love this story. Yeah. So you get these red, black, buffalo check Mackinac jackets named after the Canadian or the British defeat of the Americans and the taking back of the fort because partly contributed by their black and red double-breasted check coats. So... That's that the beginning amazing. of the blanket coat, right? Yeah, which is, like you said, a very Canadian thing. Yeah. That Mackinac style you saw being produced. Everybody probably produced close it. to its original Filson form. produced it. Up until like the 30s, right? Well, you see it Like they still, still were producing. Everybody, every time you see that black and red check wool pattern in a hunting jacket, that yeah. goes back to. But the Filson, what we call the Filson Mackinac now is so different than like the shawl collar version oh, that for probably sure. was originally for produced. For sure. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you're a vintage guy. So you know how exciting it is when you find those early blanket shawl collared coats from the 20s and the 10s, if you oh, find amazing. one. And they're just so spectacular and beautiful. And you can imagine. Oh, yeah. These coats are go back to the War of eighteen twelve, right? You know, so uh, you know, after Hudson's Bay, you get the opening of woolen mills, and now you have access to North American made blankets that you can make into shawl colored double breasted coats. And in the Southwest, <clears throat> the in, indigenous peoples of the Southwest would weave up uh, blankets and carpets, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, uh, those patterns were adopted, uh, and homaged and replicated into the Pendleton, which was a very early woolen mill, not the earliest, but an early woolen mill, uh, and into those patterns and those Southwestern native patterns were, it, woven into those blankets, I imagine initially to trade with the indigenous populations and later then more as a sort of touristy or more uh, uh, a saleable item to the colonial white uh, whites that wanted something that looked uh, indigenous, right? So... Yeah, totally. That makes Pendleton now is making blanket coats and they become a thing of the 1910s and the 1920s and the 1930s, right? So this tradition of repelling the Americans in between 1808 and 1812 is now an American tradition of these blanket coats that stretches all the way to Bob Dylan because if you look in the 1960s, you see great pictures of like rock stars wearing 1920s and 30s blanket coats. And I can, you just have to Google it on the internet. And they're wearing the original vintage pieces in the sixties that they bought at a vintage store. We'll, try, we'll right? try to get some, we'll try to get some pictures going on this episode here. So people can see what we're talking about. Yeah. And as a vintage dealer too, you often find early pieces that you know were 
just homemade numbers, yeah. right? Like homemade blanket coats, like from those Pendletons or lots from the Hudson Bay too. And then some that you can tell were like Hudson Bay, Original. their own manufacturing, yeah. early manufacturing, but they had some really unique styles. And, and then the homemade ones, you just never know what you're going to get. Like crazy hooded things with frills or fringe or different designs. And it's, it's just a folk art at that point. Absolutely. And, you know, until the invention of industrial and until these factories started opening up at the turn of the century, you know, 1900, uh, these things were sewed by people, you know, a factory basically meant you had access to a sewing, a pedal sewing machine, the Singer Adler concoction. Right. And, yeah, you know, if you, the early days of denim, these were Jewish guys parked in Nevada with one sewing machine sewing up, uh, you know, work clothes for guys and like getting a reputation. Like I hear, uh, uh, Joseph Stein's pants are, are, are really strong. Uh, I'm going to go over there and get his as opposed to the other guy down the street. Right. So that's also where these coats originally start from until factories appear. I have some very early wool shawl collar blanket coats and they they're they're really they're quite amazing they don't really exist because of moths and and you know like how do you keep a wool garment alive for 150 years it's almost impossible but this tradition of this polo fabric goes back to that tradition of the pendleton fabric which goes back to the tradition of indigenous first peoples patterns right is it authentic is it a ripoff? Is it an homage? That's up to whatever your woke moral code is for me. <laughs> you know, like to me, it's the history of American clothing. Like I got a stack of blankets here going back to 1900 in my living room. I'm sitting on one. This is probably like a 1940s, uh, you know, uh, uh, homage to an and, indigenous pattern. Yeah. You know, did indigenous people use these blankets? Sure they did. Everybody did. That was what was available, you know. So is it a ripoff or a utility piece? I don't know. They called them saddle blankets, you know, and uh, people put them in their southwestern cabins. And But the patterns are beautiful. Is there more yeah, British-style totally. patterns than uh, southwestern patterns? There's all, all the patterns, you know, and... Uh, yeah, H Hudson Bay typically had diff. Like Hudson Bay was more British patterns. Obviously, Pendleton was way more um, Southern First Nations patterns. Yeah. Or, or I guess again, they did they create those for them, or were they taking patterns that maybe they found in beaded works and then putting them on a blanket? Well, I could tell you, uh, I I used to collect Navajo rugs, for example, and uh, uh, obviously there's a lot of inspiration there. The the family still runs the woolen mill and I'm sure they have their own history and I'm sure there's probably some professor somewhere clenching his fist at me mistelling something who would have uh has, has devoted their lives to you know trade blanket history uh but uh you know the inference is there and the garments yeah, totally. are there and this collaboration is like coming full circle from the war of 1812 because you're taking a beautiful weave blanket in Italy, global, global wool and mill, and yeah. uh, with a southwestern pattern that's clearly drawn from the southwest and shipping it back to a Canadian, me, who is taking predominantly american influence motorcycle jacket and work jacket designs and rebuilding a blanket coat inspired by the mackinaw jacket invented here in the first place so it's like a beautiful meta 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 as i like to say meta 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 and it's an homage to an homage to an homage to another homage like the it all works so beautifully together this jacket here I is love a blanket that. That jacket, a... right? That's why I wore it. Yeah. This is from Ayers Woolen Mills, one of the oldest woolen mills in North America. Irish guy moves to Quebec, Lachine, and opens one of the first woolen mills. And this is probably from the 20s. This is one of his blankets. And uh, like, what a wild design. 
And now this guy has nothing to do with the Southwest. I have no idea where this design comes from, but it looks like, look at it. It looks, it looks, it looks Southwest, but it can also be passed off as just a cool pattern almost. Right. But what would he be doing in, in like 1900 with a Southwestern <laughs> pattern? It's not, it's like some sort of like, maybe it's like Doric. Maybe it's a Greek influence. Like I want something that looks Greek. I don't know, but this is the great hive mind of humanity right i i often say and i you know it frustrates me i like the idea of homage so homage is when you hack tip to your mentors so the japanese are very good at this uh uh but the line between homage and uh uh let's say copyright infringement or <laughs> or uh, yeah forget copyright joking let's say copying versus homage is very thin right and uh when you have homage it it creates a whole new work that's better than the original and and when you copy something you're literally just ripping it and uh there's not enough of your own creativity in there to claim authenticity right so it's more the difference between uh, copying an item and copying an idea, right? So this is very relevant to me right now because there's all this like cat fights going on between different clothing companies that are copying each other's stuff where they don't, they're all laying claim to the idea. And in a lot of ways, they didn't come up with the idea. And in, and in my world, everybody is like, Oh, well, it's just copying vintage stuff. Whenever you do, whenever you're a copycat, it's always like, oh, well, you're just copying vintage stuff. So I'm doing it too. Right. And creativity lies in the idea where you're adding, where the, the whole is greater than the parts, uh, you're moving something forward. And that's very hard to quantify. You know, it's like when rappers used to take, you know, uh, soul songs and, and rip, you know, uh, little samples, little yeah. samps, and then turn them into something greater. You know, that's not a, that's not a, that, that, that was a greater work. Right. And then we have these copyright infringement cases where someone's like, well, that's just his work. And you just put like a different face, you know? Right. So I find that this collaboration is really prescient to that whole structure of what is the idea versus you know, what is the reference versus what are we copying something? Cause in, in this case, for example, I'm using referenced jacket designs that I've changed characteristically and fundamentally both at a pattern level, material level, manufacturing process level, and then adding a whole new tradition, a heritage of blending wool blankets with those things and bringing a nineties vibe to a vintage vibe that's actually a 30s vibe and just going back to the 30s right so that's like a whole uh, and you know a whole it, deal it's, right it's something that yeah and that it was a found material that was created by polo that they had referenced for their lines from their in from their inspiration or homage previously yeah again it's just this wild wild story and um you know we wouldn't have gone out and created that fabric, but we, we were trying to preserve it in what it was created as in the first place. I get it. Actually, if I could, I would create beautiful blanket patterns, but I can't because it costs <laughs> like a bill. Man, I wish I was a giant brand. The shit I would make. Oh my God. Anyway. But, uh, yeah. Have, have you been a, so let's, let's bring it to, that was amazing. By the way, I think there's so much history told in this episode. This is like crazy valuable. But we got to get into leather now. Yeah. We want to know like how, because you're the king of leather. Like I said before, how did you get infatuated with the leather jacket? Was it, you know, again, you kind of told a history of fabric just then, like yeah. through wool. And then like you talk about how in Nevada, there's people making pants because the miners couldn't wear wool anymore because they're ripping on the job. And, you know, wool was the like staple fabric. Obviously, leather has also been a staple fabric. For leather's the first gee, fabric. I don't know the leather is the first. When human beings yeah, exactly. yep. made fire, they were wearing like a leather thong. Okay. Like that's a, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. 
<laughs> That's amazing. So talk about your, your like, why was it leather that really got you and what was it about the jackets? Ah. Uh, Okay, so that that's kind of a that's a, a a bit of a you know it's never easy with me, Drew. Man, like it's gonna be a long story, so I apologize. But <laughs> you know, so I'm we're here for it. Man. I'm 56, right? And uh, I had a bit of a, like a rough and tumble life. I was a bit of a nerdy kid, like smart kid, too smart. I went to a weird hippie school, then I went to public school. Uh, I'm not gonna say life in the eighties was easy for, for me. This is back in the days when people used to fight. Bullying was like still cool. So, you know, uh, I came out of high school, uh, uh, a bit of a punk rock, anti-culture, anti, uh, anti-society kind of person. And, uh, when I went to university, one of my good friends who was in a punk band was like trying to get me to come sing. And, and part of his incentive, he gave me his Bramaco D pocket jacket, which for the punk scene in Canada in the eighties, you could buy a Bramaco D pocket jacket for a hundred bucks down on young street. Right. And the equivalent would be like the shot jacket for the remote, you know, the one star, it was like a hundred bucks in New York. Right. So the Bramaco yeah. D pocket jacket, which was a knockoff of a Harley, was our punk rock jacket. So he gave me his and his was already all fucked up with safety pins and paint and patches and shit. And, and I was like, thanks man. And I, <laughs> I used to go out and like fight Nazis and shit, you know, that's what you did in the Indians. I don't know how to explain it. Just, you know, people, I have a very punchable face. So, and I, I went to university in like, farm town a place we call ottawa where people like to punch people in the face so my first <laughs> real leather jacket was my go ahead punch me in the face leather jacket so uh you know like leather is kind of armory and uh, that was my go-to uh uh the bar conflict zone jacket so that was the first one i fell in love with I had, I became a historian. I got a question about this, yeah. this time period. Yeah. So we're talking like you're, you're saying you're a punk, your but your buddy gave you this jacket, really cool story, but also like in the punk scene, were, was that where like the say Nazis of that time, these any no, no, they, they people didn't, would hang? Okay. Or? They had their own, they had their own scene, right? They couldn't mix with like regular punks cause they get the shit kicked out of them. They had their own Nazi scene, but like. You know, it was for some reason, you know, before the internet, some people thought it was okay to be a Nazi. You know, like now everybody's out of the yeah. closet. They just call them uh, Proud Boys. But uh, back then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they they, uh, they were sort of in the closet, you know, white shoelaces, whatever, <laughs> right? So, but, you know, it was a different time, right? And, uh, uh, you kind of had to, you know, I was a doorman at bars, you know, it was a routine job for me. I worked at a bar where there was like a fist fight or a brawl every night. And with my traumatized, untherapized brain, that was like a healthy expression of my inner rage towards my father. So, you know, like whatever. <laughs> you know, Let it my... out. So you probably became a pretty good fighter that day. Are you a good fighter? No, no, not new. No, I'm an old man with a broken body. Uh, what I am is a uh, really good coat maker. So uh, from that uh, perspective, I fell in love with that coat. And uh, uh, I don't know what happened to it. I, I had a couple coats that I was in love with. A, a, a World War II veteran from Dunkirk gave me his Sunday coat. But that one... Uh, was wool, double wool overcoat. And that one, unfortunately, uh, I witnessed a motorcycle accident and I, I gave it to the injured guy and coated him with it and left him with the ambulance crew. So I never saw that one again. But uh, that was my favorite leather jacket. And when I got in the vintage business, I didn't realize the world of leather jackets that pre-existed that coat. And when I started picking 
Like I got this Endura of California racing stripe jacket and I'm like, what is this? And then I got a, a yeah. Bates of California, like flat track racing jacket. And I was like, what is this? And then it just kept going from there to the next one, to the next one. My first leather togs jacket. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> right? you know, and, uh, uh, I just, and all the names of the man, the people, they're all Jewish surnames, right? So I was like, you know, like, because you know the vintage business, you 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 got to study this stuff if you want to get the value for it. And back before the internet, we we didn't have sources to go look this stuff up, you know. So I started calling companies in the phone book and talking to company owners and all those old bastards were still alive back then and they loved to talk you know they're in their 70s and 80s and they're like David let me tell you about the schmutter I came <laughs> here from London after I stole a horse in Poland <laughs> you know they're, they're those guys right so you get <laughs> you get like endless interviews with these old men telling you I invented thread in 1947 now everyone uses my thread and then the next guy I invented that thread he didn't invent the thread you know <laughs> right so you know a little bit of myth a little bit of truth but uh I spent my time talking to all these old men and listening to their stories to kind of flesh out all those times in the rag houses by myself buried in giant mounds of dead people's clothes. Right. So I needed something to give my brain stimulation. And it, as I said before, because of that, uh, realization around, uh, the polo, the, the double RL jacket. And when yeah. Rin Tanaka, the guy who runs inspiration, when he wrote his first book, the, uh, the motorcycle jacket book, I got that yeah. book and I was like, so first off, like fully, like a third of the jackets in that book came from me that I had sold the dealers in LA. Right. And I always had this like yeah. self-esteem problem because like, I'm like, I'm selling all this stuff. Where does it go? And then I see all these other guys and they're like, you know, greatest vintage experts in the world. And I'm like, but I sold that jacket and I sold that jacket and I sold it. And I started to think, one, I can't sell those jackets anymore because they're, they're, they have too much value to me. And two, I can't sell them anymore because I know everything there is to know about these damn jackets. Right? So when I saw Rin's book, I just, I became a jacket hoarder and everybody was getting mad at me. They're like, what happened to the, where's my leather jackets? And I'm like, I'm a jacket hoarder. You're not getting your jackets, <laughs> sir. <laughs> you know, so. And that was when. Oh man, you know, I didn't know it was that. So what? What year was that? I think I might have that on my shelf here. Uh, what no, year I don't was have it that published? Issue. What year was it published? Two thousand and something. What year was that? Two thousand. Yeah, when you when you look up when you look at like the different genres, leather jackets, denim obviously is like the main one. Yeah. Um, t-shirts or whatever hippie fashions you know leather really has a lot of intricate details there's so much to like study on a jacket compared to other things i guess denim I, and I jeans don't know. You as know, well but I, I, i'll argue something interesting I, i've met some denim experts and now you know because i've been doing this a long time i meet these guys that do replica denim right every yeah every genre of clothing has so many, if you really want to nerd into it, so many nuanced components to it. I would argue almost that leather jackets are more simple in construction than any other garment because leather's so hard to sew <clears throat> that you can't screw up. Like there's no going back, right? You put a hole in the leather, the hole's there forever. And and it's so heavy a material to work with that it's that there's only so many construction techniques that you can employ when making a leather jacket, yeah. right? Whereas I've seen these denim guys like my buddy Moisen Endrime, you know, he'll go on about 
you could make a pocket this way. You could make a pocket that way. You could use this machine. You could use that machine. You could fold this under. You can, you know, and, and frankly, I have met master tailors old and young and, and, and some of the, uh, you know, the ways that these guys make bespoke suits and they're, you know, hand creating, uh, basting stitches and, 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 and buttonholes by hand. I'm using a vintage Reese 101, uh, buttonhole machine. Some of these guys are making the buttonholes by hand. I, I talked to a guy on the, uh, Instagram the other day. He's making denim jeans by hand. I'm like, what is that? Like 800 hours. And he's no 80, 80 hours. Hand sews, fuck. Hand sews Japanese denim jeans. And they look like they're sewn with a machine. And I'm like 80 hours, man. Like to me, that's like a, ten thousand dollar pair of jeans right there like how do you make a living sewing at one pair of jean every two weeks right you know and yeah and, and most most people don't even most a lot of factories don't even have the machines that are able to sew leather like we we bought one once yeah. and we could only sew like thinner leather we couldn't we couldn't even do horse because that's like a special well machine it's you know you can always buy machines but you know, no, it's not the same as fabric, right? Leather's a, a, a different kind of material and it requires a different understanding of construction techniques. It involves glue and hammers and tape and skiving and riveting and, and, <laughs> but in reality, the majority of the machine we use is a single needle walking foot machine which is very different than if you said went to a sweatshirt factory and they have a serger and a flat lock and a single needle machine and they you know you have all these different machines to construct one sweatshirt we use one machine and a buttonhole machine and a skiving machine and everything else is done by hand right so it's much yeah, more of a totally. craft work and uh, a, a choice production technique but in the end, really what makes leather more important is the pattern. Like if you make a bad pattern in, in, in clothing, no one would know because clothing stretches, it shrinks, you know, but you make a bad pattern in leather and it doesn't work somewhere. Everybody knows they won't, they, it won't work and it feels terrible to wear. So, uh, you know, uh, understanding pattern making and understanding the mechanical nature of the way clothing works is very important in leather because there is no give, right? So <laughs> you have to have all the mechanical components of that jacket working, functioning, right? Um, I find that all very interesting. My real interest in more these days is again, back to uh, uh, copying versus homage, right? Like ideas, because when someone's buying into my brand, they're buying into my brain and my obsession and my team's experience. And it's not always apparent on the surface. People tell me it is, but you know, there's lots of expensive, but cheaper than mine replicas of what I do. Right. And yeah. that's another thing. Like we make everything one by one. Right. So when we make one jacket, it's not perfect. Perfect. The, the goal is not perfection in a straight line because that's production. Our job is perfection in giving you something that fits perfectly. It's bespoke. It's your choices of materials. It's your choice of liner. It's your choice of model. Right. And that isn't about perfection. That's about creating a perfect object for you, the individual. Right. So that's a very different model than a production model, right? So, so where does where does where do you, where do you draw the line? You know, there's a lot of companies, other maybe makers that go really into like the crazy mishmash where they're like, this is like ten genres put together, you know, or there's some that are like, we're creating this exactly as we found it, right? And that's like the copy. Where's your line that you try to design? Okay, I interrupt this episode to bring you a word from our sponsor. I have a new sponsor. Thank you very much, Gemma, for supporting the show. Um, and I just put Jesse and Kelly. Look who's in the hotel room with me. Hello. Kelly Cole. What up, what up, what and Jesse Heifetz. And I just put them on to Gem app. Okay, Jesse, search something. What are you going to search? Butthole surfers, Steve. <laughs> what do you got, Kelly? Uh, I'm looking at 
Tennessee tuxedo shirts because he's my favorite cartoon character. You know, I didn't need another way to be obsessed with vintage t-shirts all day and all night. Another way to search. This is ridiculous. But you got one now. Jesse, what are you finding? A lot of butthole. How many surfers are coming up? We got uh, 224 results in butthole. <laughs> okay, guys. Gem app is your one-stop search solution for vintage clothing. You download the app. You type in what you want to find. It's going to search websites all across the internet. It's going to search eBay. It's going to search Grail. It's going to search Etsy. It's also going to search independent websites like F is in Frank. So there you go. You guys should all go download Gem app. Uh, they support the show, so you should support them. Go download the Gem app and find vintage faster, easier than any way you're doing it right now. Back to the show. It's a very interesting question because it involves a couple of things, right? What makes someone a designer versus a copier? What makes a brand its own unique thing? It's style. And what makes some brands great and some brands garbage? Because like, the history of vintage clothing, but you're a rag picker. Do you have brands that you pick that you're like, wow, compared to other brands where you could still sell the item, some the same period, but it's just infinite, infinitesimally or largely not as good as another brand. Give me an example, something you could think of. Uh, like, like we talked about Filson. Like, I just love that brand. I love the history of it. I love the quality. When you find that garment, you're like, this is so like. The, the the construction everything about it is is just beautiful to me they copyrighted um, their jacket originally and after a while they they ran out of the resources to copyright you can't copyright clothing anymore in that way you could copyright uh elements of clothing right that are tied to yeah. your brand but they ran out of money to prosecute people back in the 20s uh you know in 30s no shit. So they just gave up because wow. they, people love their jackets so much. They just kept coming up with slightly different versions. And you know, when you, uh, when you're picking that duck canvas, there was like 30 other brands that had duck canvas jackets that were not too dissimilar from Nelson. Yeah. Hirsch Vice, Pioneer. Um, but there are brands well, that like, them all, stick really, out. But, like when you yeah. pick up their stuff, you're like, like leather togs, you're just like, who was the genius that envisioned this, these lines, this sewing, this fabric, you know, you, 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 you could look at, um, the early days of those big Mac plaids that were just like magnificent compared to a lot of the other brands, you know, you had five brothers, you had big Mac, you had all these other plaid brands and you would pick up one brand and, You'd be like, whoever their fabric designer was that was ordering those flannels, wow, they were just like drop dead gorgeous, knock down different than these other brands. Or you could look at, you know, the days of Stifle when Stifle was making that fabric. Why is it so sought after now, right? It was this beautiful sort of like almost calico esque resist dye printing denim that. I think there's only one factory I know of in the world that still does that original kind of denim in there in Africa, in South Africa, you know, like it was just such a beautiful, beautiful, that Wabash look was just so, so perfect compared it's to other makers. too, because that was a very, it was quite thin compared to other denims of the yeah. time. So, and, uh, it didn't stand up. Really, so the yeah. question becomes, you know, great design. I, I'm not in the froofy European world of fashion designers, so I can't, I, I can't tell you about Dior versus, you know, any of Chanel versus uh, all these other fancy uh, uh, dressmaking and clothing companies. But I could tell you about leather jacket brands that there were certain brands that were so much better than other brands you know, favorite brands like Seattle sport togs that came out of Seattle woolen mills. Their leather was spectacular. Their patterns were sexy. And in the world of vintage leather jackets, people, you know, leather togs at Peter's jackets are like number one and number two right there. Right. You know, and, uh, of course, because of my obsession with leather jackets, I have other brands that 
you know, wh whoever the team was that was putting them together, probably in a shop not dissimilar to mine. So I understand the process of how they came up with their designs and their patterns and their materials. They really lucked into uh, a great design aesthetic and a creative aesthetic and a relationship with their customers that created some really unique pieces. So me, some people tell me that my brand has a different look than other leather jacket brands, right? People who are yep. really into clothing, they say, your jackets are just different, right? And I attribute that to my compendium of knowledge of the history of jackets to be a great designer, to be an IP the creator. You have to actually know everything first before you create something new, right? Because until you know what you're doing, you know, anybody can say, oh, well, that looks cool. Make that right. That's the majority of people out there. They're like, that's cool. Make that, make something like that. Right. That's not design. Yeah. That's not creation. That's not IP. That's not an idea. An idea is I have this idea for this jacket. What if we use this material and that material and this pattern with this detail and it creates something that looks whole right from the finish, from the moment it's finished. Meaning it doesn't look like I Frank, I call it Frankensteining. A lot of brands Frankenstein stuff together. Right. And they don't it's know kind of why. what I was saying. Yeah. They just, from the mishmash. They're just yeah. mishmashing up. Right. Oh, it's a mishmash. Right. Yeah. Maybe the intent wasn't to create Frankenstein, but that's the outcome. Right. Well, Polo does it a lot. A lot of Polo's creations are, are completely Frankenstein. And then there's some brands that go to another level with it. And you're like, that just looks out of place, you know, like too much Frankenstein. But I do I don't, appreciate if it's done well. I, 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 I don't know if I would say Polo is a Frank. You know, you guys, Jesse talks about his love for Ralph, right? Mr. Lifshitz. And, of course. Uh, uh, you know, what he really did was something magical, right? Like I rarely give credit to the past as I should, even the recent past. But his magic was he, like I imagine, and I'm projecting here, like myself, grew up in the Shmata business and knew the, the Jews in the, the trenches of New York. And uh, he was like, I want to be a European brand the way those hoity-toity Europeans are. But what is the American style? Like, what is it, right? And because he grew up in the trenches, the American style was the East European Jewish style of workwear, the East European Jewish style of leather jackets, the East European Jewish style of making less fussy, more practical garments that fit and functioned in the everyday life of the people that were buying them. And I feel like Polo kind of captured that Jewish love of all things British because we were predominantly excluded from polite European society. In Britain, there was a period around the turn of the century that Ralph would have been aware of where Jews were allowed into polite society but had to fit in and be British-like, right? You know, like how many Jews yeah. do you know love scotch like me? It's like, what do you think that is? That's like the resonant memory of wanting to go to the club that you weren't a member of and you know picking up golf and drinking a whiskey with the white people and uh i i feel if i were to write my version of polo my version is the jewish man's take of american worker clothes and british high culture and being an outsider and trying to create something uniquely american that made regular people insiders that gave them a look of the class of Britain and the work function of America and slamming them together into what would be like an archetype of American fashion versus European fashion, right? And that is really a product, I would guess, if I had to use my big brain to imagine what goes on in Ralph Lauren's head, is a product of his being a Jewish kid growing up as an outsider 
in an insider culture where there was no culture, right? America didn't really have a culture. It had a culture of industrialism. It had a culture of corporatism, of profiteerism, uh, of the new world with no rules uh, where immigrants could become wealthy uh, or fail. And that culture produced an American work where the World War II produced an American military where and all those elements of Americanism got wrapped up in a pretty British package. That's what I imagine was the polo brand, right? So Yeah, no, that's a great description. You know, what I was referring to was like the, say, like polo country where this fireball's from. Yeah. You'll see a lot of pieces that have like a, a hunting coat, but they've taken a military pocket and put it on or they've taken a Western wear detail and put it on the hunting thing. So you'll have like a mix up yeah. of things in some of their lines. But the, of course, the polo brand is like, like you had said. Well, I mean, I don't know, know 90s. This American Ivy style. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know 90s clothing, right? Like that's you young, uh, you young guns. You young guns. You, you <laughs> totally. young children. Would, I'm would an you, you young ones, you know this <laughs> stuff. We, you know. we got an old head here, guys. Yeah. Wh which I love the take. And I, would you say that Frank, like double RL now is somewhat of a Frankenstein? I try not to give opinions about active I'm, I, clothing okay. brands. Not, be, Fair not enough. just because of lawsuits or, but I have to work with all these people and they all know what they are and they know where they get their ideas from and they know what they're making and they know the constraints of their market and they're not dumb because we're in the world of the internet so they get to choose their level of creativity and idea ship and they get to choose the things they make and they know what they sell and 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 as such it's not that i'm being a baby because you know i have a big mouth and i i will yap on about shit all the time but like what i focus on is not if you don't have anything nice to say don't say it i'm not that guy i focus on what i like to create and when I see my stuff get ripped, like I have, it's accelerated so badly that sometimes I have companies that are not just copying styles of my jackets, but they're copying the name of the jacket, you know, and like, no way. it sounds dumb, but like, if you Google Avro jacket, like there's like three pages of this dumb, you know, motorcycle jacket called an Avro that's clearly made in Pakistan by another brand and it's like they clearly camped on my name and my reputation because an avro as you know was the, the groundbreaking aircraft company british and canadian that invented in my case the jack was named after the avro arrow which was the first uh sound barrier breaking jet plane that the american government demanded we smash into pieces because it was such a threat as a dominant air superiority uh, aircraft and then scammed us out of the avionics, the aviation industry. So I thought, what an iconic name for my first sort of cool aviation motorcycle crossover jacket is an Avro. So that kind of stuff pisses me off. But like, you know, that's just like Do you think one there's na component. naivety there where that company... Do you think there's naivety there where, say, a company that copies you doesn't think that you created that name? They're just, like, thinking that's the name of a style and they they don't do any research and then they just end up going that route? Or Oh, they do research. Just straight... They just camp on my Instagram and go, I like that. I like that. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> make something like that. Oh, that color combination. That's really yeah. good. Make that. You know, there was, like, a... There's a classic... I, I, I made a jacket for Nancy called the Spirit Bear. I wanted to make my grizzly jacket, which I designed on a napkin. There is no precedent to, of that Wolverine jacket. There's no vintage jacket that looks like that. If you find it, if anybody can find that vintage jacket that looks like that, I'm more than happy to 
say it's serendipity, but I designed it on a napkin in LA at an inspiration show. And, uh, uh, you know, as my ideal jacket, now I see multitudes of grizzly jackets with an A1 body and, and that design from various companies, all designers, right? All people who are always yeah. like, oh, you copied me people. Right. And, um, I took that pattern and I decided to make her like a light colored one, like, uh, white on white. In this case, it was like natural and white and, uh, and yeah. make that grizzly jacket. Right. And I called it a spirit bear after those albino black bears that you guys have out on the West coast. Cause like, what's a better yeah. name for a grizzly jacket than a spirit bearer? It, you know, it honors this sort of like weird crossover indigenous Western Canadian, uh, animal albino bear in the West coast. And yeah, that only, that only occurs in like one Island yeah. in this one area, yeah. you know, you know, so I thought what a great name for a grizzly jacket, you know, and I made it out of love for Nancy. Right. And now there's like all sorts of versions of that thing floating around on the internet. And I just kind of think, you know, do people know when they, I think, I think that I have a kind of brain where everything I see and hear kind of goes in and stays there. So I can create inspirational things in a coherent idea. I think most people in our industry just see stuff and then it's like their idea. It's so, like, you know, oh, like I saw that now I'm going to make it, but I don't remember where I saw it. It's my idea. I'm a genius. Right. You know, so, uh, but the difference is like, I have a story to my brand, right? My story is the history of jackets. My story is the Canadian narrative. My story is trying either to copy pieces and update them that everybody accepts are the coolest pieces from the past. Like who didn't do a J100 cafe racer? I didn't invent that. That was Buko yep. that invented that, but it's such an iconic jacket that I couldn't have a jacket line without that jacket. Now, real McCoys in Japan did it, albeit the most authentic version of it. And, you know, I looked up to them as a brand. My goal was to try be as good as those guys, you know? And, yeah. uh, so that's copy. We were all copying something, right? Uh, oh, well, clothing in general, it's like, there's, there's a shirt body, there's a t-shirt body, there's a jacket no, body, there's a million leather. variations the of it. in the patterns though, right? Like, you know. Well, of course, yeah. but I'm saying like, there's nobody inventing like, uh, a, like well, unless a dress, a coverall, and overall. You know, unless, unless we have more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's like these things work. We don't need to completely reinvent right. the way things But I mean, the subtlety, what I'm trying to get at is the subtlety of the copying versus ideasmanship, right? So I have Jackie's. Yeah. I have Jackie's and Jackie's that are uh, direct copies of stuff uh, that I, you know, built a new pattern around that fits a modern person, right? Um, I just copied the Beck jacket, the iconic thirties Beck jacket perfectly. Like I literally have nine of them measured every single piece. And I'm quite proud of that perfect replica of it because it's such a weird and unique early pattern. I did a collaboration with free note and they're in their store and people love them. They're like, it's so weird. The sleeve so short and the shoulders so wide, but that's, it's just how it worked, right? And it creates like a perfect vintage look. But the majority of the things I make are a combination of design elements from jackets in, in, in the past and then my imaginary uh, creation of something new, right? And then you have the material component, like a color combination or a liner combination. Like I put Marine Corps camo and Tiger Strike into my liners and i did that because in my collecting of vintage jackets i would find like guys would come over world war ii and they might have their a2 and the liner was worn out so they might take their uniform or someone's uniform and this cut it up and sew it in as a liner and then i made some jackets with like vintage original blankets as liners because i would also 
historically find like old vintage coats with blanket liners. I was like, what a great idea to, you know, uh, create a liner out of a vintage blanket. These were some of my early ideas, right? Um, you know, I created a whole bunch of black and white jackets because in the fifties, there was a tradition of the black and white motorcycle jacket. And I, uh, that tradition goes all the way back to the thirties. The rarest jacket I ever saw was a Peter's jacket that was black and white. And why would you make a black and white jacket? Well, if you're riding down a dirt road in the middle of the night, in the age of beginning ages of the automobile, you'd, you'd want someone to be able to see you and not run you down. There were no rules, you know, and, uh, yeah, fair enough. Right. So spot work and white, je- white trim would highlight that you were out there on that dark, muddy road riding down. On- Is that why spot work was created? I, I think that was one component of spot work. I think another component was that it reinforced the construction of the jacket. It reflected light from headlights and, uh, uh, you know, you're wearing a black jacket. You, you want to be seen that there was a real, uh, explosion of spot work from people returning from the war and being members of bomber squadrons and they would form clubs and it was a way of expressing, you know, your own sense of art on a jacket that goes all the way to the eighties and punk rock jackets. Right. So, yeah, you know, customization and artwork. Right. So that tradition of customization probably started as clever reinforcement. Also, I, I talked to old bastards that would tell me that, you know, when I went down on my motorcycle, all those spots hit the ground and protected the leather from disintegrating, you know, right. You know, that's true. uh, You know, so, so I had heard different people tell me different things, but this is folk legend to some extent there's no way to distill the exact answer there's a way to sort of distill from your experience how these things unfold so because i make jackets for example i can look at a jacket and see how the person who made that original vintage jacket sewed it or the choices that they made to save money or to spend money or why they pick something or how they did something because I do that, right? I know how hard it is to find a liner, how hard it is to find a zipper, how hard it is to sew a certain way or to build something a certain way. So you you can imagine the way that these companies put things together. That's why I'm giving you my uh, Ralph Lauren imagination, but I had the privilege of knowing his generation of people that came from Europe. That was my family. Right. So yeah. I know what they were like. I live on Spadina where all the old Jew factories are. My grandparents worked in them. Right. So, you know, I know what the Shmata industry was like. My, my, I've been living with the last of the wholesalers, you know, for 30 years. Right. So, you know, totally. So you mentioned before you were saying, uh, talking about a certain leather jacket as being like, oh, the, the J, the J, J 100, yeah, the J, J 100 from Buco, yeah. which is like a straight zip cafe racer, yeah. uh, classic body that was made by everybody can still being made by a lot of everybody. Yeah. What is like, give us like your top five of all time, um, bodies, like leather jackets created. Well, you just have to look at my collection of you know <laughs> i only make yeah. my favorite things right so the j100 uh the late 60s back flat track racer which is not on my website but i make one uh okay the leather togs early uh the 30s d pocket right uh yeah. the sentinella which is leather togs uh uh <laughs> one of the most beautiful jackets i've ever seen was a peter's jacket but I don't own it, and uh, 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 it's a really crazy uh, offset, but it was a button front. It was pre-zipper, Peters of San Francisco. Okay. But I don't make that one. Uh, I know people that make... Uh, you keep talking about Peters. We ju- I just bought a Peters yesterday. Oh, yeah? What style? A really nice 30s. It's like the motorcycle style, but more of a sports coat. Like, 
We've got Drum you're gonna have Zipper to send me a has, picture, obviously, now that you've yeah, uh, teased me, you. and I, I can't imagine yeah. it was very inexpensive, to say the least. Uh, no, I paid some money for it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't have a Peter's jacket in my collection because that's California stuff, and I'm in the East Coast, so it would have never come in the rag, right? Um, I you never got one on your all your time picking. Not once. No. Wow. Uh, there was one guy was on the verge of selling me the rarest one I've ever seen. I still have a picture of it. And I have no idea what happened to it. He told me a tale, but it's still out there in his brother's hands. And uh, it is the holy grail of Peter's jackets. It's, I, I know roughly what state it's in, and I have a picture of it, uh, but uh, uh, I have no idea the guy who's currently holding it. So, uh, but uh, I have a early Langlet's cascade jacket. That is amazing. I'm not a Langlet's guy. It's the, the stuff they make now is too heavy, but this one jacket is like the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful jackets in my collection. <laughs> um, Everybody loves Buko jackets. Uh, I'm not a Buko guy, uh, per se. Uh, they're a little too uh, Buko-esque for me. Uh, the Bramaco <laughs> Cafe Racer, the Raider, is uh, one of my favorite jackets. Shanhouse and Sons and Block Built of California, which was the motorcycle brand offshoot of Block Tanneries. So those are my icons of leather jackets, right? The Bramaco that you just mentioned, is that, uh, what's, which one is that? You That's said, the cafe racer, you know, that with like the, the, the stretchy bits on no, it, no, like no, the no, lines it's on the clean, shoulder and simple cafe racer with the collar okay. and, it, uh, very British looking the owner, Jerry and I had a lot of conversations back in the nineties and two thousands. And, uh, I recorded some of them in the early days with something, some format, but I can't find the recordings, but he was the oh, no way. most hilarious guy on the planet. You know, him and his wife, wife yelling at him in the background. Uh, <laughs> I, I became friends with his daughters. His brother was the one that uh, uh, owned Bristol and Drospo. So uh, they had a family breakup. So he's like, here, take a factory and go run your own brand. And, uh, and that's what, okay. I was wondering that how that was connected yeah. and, um, uh, shields leather, Lauren shields, who I also talked with. I don't know if he's still alive or not. A lot of their jackets were identical to the Bramaco jackets in the sixties. And, uh, <laughs> Lauren's family were bicycle, uh, builders. They brought the first Japanese bikes into Canada. I think they brought Nishiki bikes. And, uh, they made, uh, motorized bicycles in the thirties in Toronto. And, uh, and then they made jackets, leather jackets, motorcycle jackets, you know, score sportswear. That, yep. was, that was the Shields family. I think they were called, uh, uh, Shields of the sixties and score in the forties. And they, uh, and they have a unique, a very unique style. A few of their jackets, right? A couple of them are incredible. That one with the big curvy zipper, that's theirs. Yeah. Right. But a lot of them look identical to Bramaco jackets, which is hilarious. Now, I don't know who copied who, whether it was Jerry copy, copying Lauren or Lauren copying Jerry. Jerry will tell you he invented everything. I mean, anyway, <laughs> I I chatted with these guys so much. The Shields family, Lauren, he had the world's biggest collection of antique bicycles. And I think he donated to the Smithsonian the last I talked to him, but that was like a decade ago. I can't imagine he's still alive. Um, but you know, these things ha were happening all over big cities in North America, these guys, but Bramaco British motorcycle company, they were the biggest, I think probably the biggest leather motorcycle, leather jacket maker in North America by far. Jerry told me if you've ever been to Montreal, St. Laurent street, you know, all those warehouses, he owned them all. Yeah. It was all Bramaco, all of it. And he. Wow. He was making 2000 jackets a week. Like that was, that's crazy Wild. numbers, you know, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. 
So you're saying like they were bigger than like say Brooks or any of these other well, big Brooks companies? Brooks came after Rebecca. Okay. And I don't know how big Brooks is that I missed out on an opportunity because uh the the owner's kid is a friend of a friend of mine. You know, it's another Jewish family. And uh yeah. and uh they they wanted me to chat. Uh and I think I missed the window because I got too busy with my my own brand. But uh you know Brooks was an yeah, offshoot. I was, I was gonna ask Brooks you about was that. an offshoot of Buco, right? Like the Sandor was originally Sandor Leathers and he was the head production guy for uh the Bo- the Eisens in Detroit and then opened Brooks. So his first his first leather jacket was a copy of the J one hundred, the first Brooks jacket, and it was called Sandor Leathers. I have one. It's great. It's exactly like a Brooks label, but it says Sandor Leathers. Anyway. So Oh yeah. wow. So you've done collabs with Himmel Brothers Leathers with probably I don't know how how many clubs have you done? You've done J- J- Japanese collabs. I do, or... I do them here and there. I made a jacket for Drake with Canada Goose. That's on I think one of the. Nice. I did that leather buffalo uh, parka with the fox fur hood and the gold zippers and the OVO silk liner. Uh, you know I do stuff. I I've always open to uh, brand building collaborations, but I like to work with people that I love and respect. Right. Because collaboration means that people need to respect your brand as much as you respect them, their brand. It doesn't matter who makes more money, you know, right? So, you know, like. Yeah, right. of course. So I need, I'm very sensitive about that, that I need people to promote me as much as I promote them, right? I'm a little tiny five-person operation. Tiny. And. And, yeah. and I, it's hard for me to make enough stuff to keep this little project going right now. Right. So when I collaborate, all I bring is me, my reputation to someone. So they need to bring their bigger brand to me in a way like their, their voice. That's why I do collaborations. So have you obviously you just said it, they came to you, um, and asked, but you missed this window. Have you been contacted by other large manufacturers to work with them? Okay, I'm not going to name names, but uh, That's fine. it happens. But usually the terms that these guys function under with corporate stuff, uh, it makes it impossible to work with them because they they have corporate brains. And, you know, I remember I was working with one brand and they were like, here's the company in China that you can order our labels from. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, you need to order our labels. Here's the number, call them, pay for them, and they'll be arriving. And then you can sew them in our collaboration. And I, I laughed and I said, you want your fucking labels in my jackets? Send me your fucking labels. Otherwise, no labels. That's your business. That's not my business. Yeah. I don't know what kind of people you're used yeah. to working with, right? But homie, don't pay for your brand stuff, you know, like, but there's, you know, there's a sort of corporate mentality that I don't really jibe with. If people are working with me, they're working with me because of the way I do things. So I have to work with brands that are small enough to understand what I do and that I respect their work and they don't get in the way because I don't do work by committee or adjustment and I don't pay multi-million dollar companies to work with them. They have to work on my terms and my terms are very basic, which is respect my integrity, my brand, my ideas, the way I do things and make sure I get paid because I can't, uh, you know, one bad deal puts me under, underwater. Right. So, you know, yeah, of course. Yeah. So some, some, some of these guys I've worked with have been incredible, you know, I'm not gonna lie. Working with Canada Goose was incredible, right? Danny, Danny yeah. treated me, and Spencer treated me like really well, you know. And uh, I wish I could have done more collaborations before they became such a massive machine, right? But uh, you know, I'm always looking. I I pitched one to Shot. I why well, I pitched one? I, I oh I, yeah. I, I, 
I feel like, you know, back when uh, I started my brand, the nice folks at SHOT asked me if I would come work with them for them uh, helping uh, re redesign their brand. And I was like, I can't do it because I'm doing my own. And they're like, you could do both. And I'm like, I can't because like, it doesn't work like that for me, right? Like I can't, how would I know? Okay, this is a cool design. Is this for me or for shot? <laughs> you know, I can't. Totally. Right? You know, like that to me, I have like this ethical structure that doesn't let me do that shit, right? So I I, I turned the offer down and I was kind of shocked to be honest because like, who was I in 2010? Like I didn't think I was important enough that someone would want me to come work for them. And, uh, but now I'm like, I'm, I'd love to collaborate with some of these brands that I respect, you know, like, cause they've been around forever and, and, and they're really good at what they do, which is supplying an affordable jacket for a lot of people made in America. Do you know how hard that is to do in a world where you could, I could get a jacket made in Pakistan for 70 bucks all in like, you know, the, the world of making a living and making a product, whether it's on the scale of a massive factory or a tiny little shop like me, it's, it's tough unless you're like, you know, and, and you can probably bring so much to their table because you have, I would imagine in a lot of these brands, more knowledge of the history of their construction than they would in probably some ways, have in I house. have more knowledge of some of these brands than they have of their own, right? And which is weird to say because in some cases, these are the children of the founders or the grandchildren of the founders, right? But, you know, again, hyperbole is a weird thing and you have a family, you know, if you talk to Dave, I'm sure Dave's like, Drew, I invented the, I mean, Dave is his dad. I invented everything. Yeah. Right? You know, so. <laughs> I invented you with your mother. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You came from my penis yeah. is what he loves to tell yeah. me. So like, you know, like it, it's objectively hard to know your own past and it's, it's objectively hard, uh, to know even, even if you study something, cause you know, I studied film history and post-structuralist theory, that's my academic background. And even now, you know, you can rewrite history still. People don't realize that things that we think are true were not true, right? Like, that's what historians do. They they look into stuff and are like, oh my God, this is a complete fabrication of colonial, you know, English history that's not true. Like, you know, it wasn't until like 10 Plus, years when, ago. when we're reading history. Was that? You, when we're reading history from the begin, from what it is, it's also just you're hearing it from someone's perception of what happened, regardless. So if it's that's that's a subjective thing in the first place, right. no matter what you're learning. Right. But like you know, I'm not like one of these weird post truth era conspiracy nut jobs. Uh, that's nonsense. I'm an expert at something, and oh, that's another thing. That's a very interesting. I love this topic. Everybody has discarded expertise because they have the internet, right? Never have I met a larger generation of blowhard morons than the ones I am surrounded by that think that they're epidemiologists and virologists and historians and political uh, political theory experts. <laughs> and uh, And oh my God, it's like, you know... I know a lot about the history of leather jackets and I will have people try and explain to me about leather jackets and I will go on these forums and they'll sit there and they'll tell, they'll tell me story. They'll, they'll, they'll discuss brands. Who's good. Who's not, who does. And I'm like, you guys don't even know. You don't even know. Like you don't even know what leather is. Like I go to tanneries for a living all over the world and talk to the owners and we make leather at tanneries with the owners. Like, and you sit there and you've just had like a 400 comment discussion about which letter leather is better than whose brand of leather is better than who else's. And, and a lot of brands and companies exploit that gap of knowledge to try and lay claim to, you know, they're the best at something they invented something or, and it's like, oh, 
Hey, the universe, you asked me about authenticity versus copying. A lot of authenticity is just about knowledge and sharing. You know, I'm not afraid to share my knowledge and how I make my things through my social media because no one would do it this way. It's stupid. It's ridiculous, right? People think you're crazy. When you go when you when the big brands come in and see how you yeah. operate, they're like, Yep, you're right. We would never copy this because it doesn't make right. any sense. They'll copy the look. They might copy some of the things, but they're, they're not gonna make the any money. No one's gonna make any money doing what I do. Right? You know, so uh it's kind of funny for me because I'm a full disclosure business. There's a couple of things I haven't disclosed once in a while, but they're they're not shameful or anything. I just doesn't seem necessary, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm mostly a full disclosure business, you know, in that if you called me and asked me, I could tell you mostly everything I do. I mean, some guys ask me, can you hook me up with your leather suppliers or whatever? I'm not giving out those phone numbers. That's your business. You go to Lina Pele. Yeah. You course. go to Milan and meet your own leather supplier. Right. But, um, <laughs> you know, but we're pretty full disclosure. <laughs> I think I've had a pretty big influence in that all the medium size brands now are using Shinky, you know, uh, Horsehide. When I started, it was like me and John Chapman of Goodwear Leather, and that was it. Now I can't even get the leather myself because there's so many people in front of the line. You know, in 2010, I made Shinky horse, horse butt boots with, uh, leather from the tannery now everybody's making shinky horse butt boots i can't get any leather again because i'm at the back of the line um you know can you tell the story of horse hide you know obviously as anybody in vintage knows horse hide jackets were popular i don't know through the early turn of the century till like the 50s i guess and that and then it became sort of out of fashion or just there wasn't a mu as much of it maybe but what was it about horse and why did we use horse at that time period it's a bit complicated it's a long story but i'll shorten it down uh the horse before the car was the main form of transportation so there's about a billion horses in north america right no cars and horses are big and when they die there's like any animal that's a farm animal what do you do you can eat them or you could throw them out. Well, throwing out 1,600 pounds, what is a horse, 1,600 pounds? You know. Yeah. You're, yeah. You'd what guess. are you going to do? Bury, you know, 100 million horses a year, right? Uh, that's the first problem. The second problem is that horse leather, horse ass, is the best boot leather there is because the way that the collagen fibers grow on a horse butt is in a circular fashion. And so when someone discovered that if you take a horse butt, turn it upside down, tan it, polish it, it makes beautiful, incredibly durable, waterproof, tough boot and shoe leather. That's called cordovan. And the shells, the two swirly parts on the horse butt, are where you get cordovan leather. So wow. the main... Never knew that role of the leather tanning business up until the 1920s was shoes, boots, and belts. And not belts for wearing, belts for machines, right? All the machines in all the factories in the world were running on leather belts. So wow. the best leather for those belts and shoes and boots was horse leather, and it was available, right? So you see this massive manufacturer of horse leather in North America because there's a lot of horses here. Europeans uh, were, you know, we were, we had trees, we had water, and we had animals. And uh, we needed money. Exporting leather to Europe was like a big deal. Canada was supplying Britain all its leather for the Industrial Revolution, you know, and footwear. And Americans were making 700 million pairs of shoes when America only had 60 million people a year. They weren't selling them in America, right? You know, so... And horse leather was the preferred leather for that. And now, front quarter horse, which literally means they would divide the horse into four 
really three pieces, the butt and the front. And the front quarter was like a waste product. So, you know, it was a very good material for making jackets, very durable. So, of course, all your jackets would be made from all that excess front leather that was left over from the shoemaking business. So that's why you see this predominant uh, uh, characteristic horse-eyed leather in jackets all the way till the 60s. And then you see the decline of it because no one had horses anymore, right? They had cars. Yeah, so, totally. So, you know, and frankly, the invention of chrome tanning, uh, it was so much easier to get cheap leather from South America, the new North America, if you will, cows. Um, the quality of garments starts to decline in the 60s and 70s where people aren't so concerned about... You know, you're spending a week's salary in 1920 to buy a jacket. It better last you 10 years working at your factory job or out in the cold because that was a lot of money, right? You're wearing your boots. Yeah. You only had one pair. They better have been the best damn boots you're ever going to buy, right? But by 1960s, with the rise of consumer culture, people started getting more into disposable items. It wasn't about these are uncomfortable and they're going to last. It was like, what could I make that's fashionable? The rises of, you know, from a worker culture to a fashion culture, right? So you see a de decline in the use of horse leather. And then, uh, you get all these, uh, doofy animal rights activists, no offense to the vegans out there. I, uh, you, I, I appreciate your personal choice, you know, but, uh, quite frankly, we still have millions of horses in North America and they were being processed in three big plants in the U S when they got old or no one wanted them for food for Europeans. And then in the eighties, the PETA people were successful at getting those, uh, processing plants that were, uh, slaughtering ethically horses for European consumption shut down. And then it all moved to Canada and Mexico. So you have this sort of declination of the quality of animal treatment, the quality because the industry itself was decimated by a social movement, right? And uh, uh, the best horses now come from Poland, mostly, predominantly, because the Poles keep a lot of horses and they treat them very well and they eat horse meat the French and the Poles and the Scandinavians. Are, you know. Yeah. And so you've got very large, well, well, uh, uh, bred and cared for animals. And when they, when they're no longer used for work or pleasure, I guess, uh, they go to the slaughterhouse. So whether you agree with that or not, I don't care. Quite frankly, I live in the world. Uh, so uh, that's where we get the horse leather that we're buying predominantly is from France and Poland, uh, from our tanneries. But that dominance yeah. of the horse basically declined with the rise of consumer culture. It also declined the with car. the rise of rubber. Yeah. Right. So for belts. Yeah. I didn't know that. Part. Yeah. Because rubber, synthetic rubber replaced, uh, the use of leather in shoes and factories. <clears throat> And uh, ironically, you see this weird uh, uh, movement to develop synthetic leather in the 30s. Uh, DuPont tries to build synthetic leather, uh, and it it's closely correlated to the development of synthetic rubber. And so you get all these oddly uh, uh, tire brands like Goodyear and American Rubber Co., and they all get into the world of shoemaking because no one wants to uh, give up their leather sold shoes. So like you'll, if you read on the internet about the first rubber soles, you'll hear about, uh, Goodyear, uh, uh, rubber soles. Goodyear gets into shoemaking because they want to sell their new product, not just for tires, but for shoes. And as they get into the world of shoemaking, you suddenly start to see all these tire rubber companies getting into the world of jacket making because they're buying leather for shoes to put rubber soles on. 
So they have all this front quarter leather. So I have like a collection of American tire, tire company leather jackets made of horse like Firestone and American rubber coat. And now I can't, I can't wow. prove to you that they, that's exactly why, because I don't have their archives, but I mean, given the general knowledge of the history that you get this weird, again, it's very meta, it's meta, meta, right? If I was making, but it's just, it's the nature of the way business works, right? If you were buying leather, you wouldn't want to throw it out. So yeah, you got to be resourceful. You got to be gotta resourceful, it out. right? So a lot of this comes out of resource. Wow. Love it. I want to touch on one more topic before we close it off yeah. here, which is your, um, you know, this other life you live where you go out and you go on crazy adventures in the in the wild canadian wilderness you kind of touched on it going up north uh before but you know because i'm facebook friends with you you know we're we're yeah. friends i i see you doing all these amazing adventures it's it's um inspirational i i would say it's it's very cool to watch and it's cool to see how you you go out there and you really go out for days at a time canoeing through the northern canadian wilderness portaging, canoeing, amazing lakes. Um, first of all, how long is it going is it going to be till you get the hell out of Toronto? Cause it sounds like your disdain for the development is, is rising all the time, but um, tell us about some of these adventures, not, you and know, what, what it is about the North I, that you love. I'm going through, you know, it's very traumatizing being here in Toronto. You know, you guys are young and you know, like if you even wanted to live here, you couldn't, right? And we're losing our best resource, which is people, young people, because, you know, speculators are making so much money tearing the city down that there's no, there's no room for people even to live here. Right. And what they're tearing down yeah. is our culture, our history, you know, our good bars, our, our cheap spaces, our retail spaces and replacing them with corporate garbage and, uh, and I, I'm so tied to my community here for better or worse that I don't want to leave it, but I literally live in the heart, the beat, the last, you know, dying heart of the downtown core. And, you know, it's like one of those weird TV shows where, you know, the guy's dying and you can hear the heartbeat. And it's like, boom, 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 right. You know, like. You're, it, it feels like that when I walk out my door, you know, I, I don't know half my neighbors are just like people with Airbnbs and, uh, a, a lot of the businesses have shuttered and the few stubborn ones that were so successful that they could buy their buildings are still here. And, and there's no cultural production happening in, in the center of the city. Whereas like, you know, broken social scene and feist and all these people came out of my neighborhood. There's nothing being generated anymore right like and that value is gone but that's where my whole world is tied up in and the the yeah. going into the wilderness is about a couple things when i was a kid i was so weird and i was sent off to summer camp well you know uh, jew camp if you will ontario you know, with all in, the yeah uh, that's big ontario with thing. all the uh upper class jewish kids and i didn't fit in Right. And the one thing that, you know, rich Jewish kids didn't like was the woods. You know, it was like, ew, why do I got to do that? Oh my God. Right. So for me, it was like, this is the greatest thing ever. I get to go out into this like forbidden wilderness and feel safe and at home. And my skills are appreciated. I could fish and make fires and, and I became an expert canoeist and then also feel like I was part of this Canadian lost Canadian heritage of, of the Corps de Bois and the fur trade and the voyageur and the wilderness. And, and now the wilderness here, first off, the people in rural Canada are the best people. Like they're just the best. They just, they're not encumbered with this pretentious bullshit city lifestyle. And all the things yeah. that I yeah for those of for those people listening to this who are American maybe never come to Canada 
95% of everybody is right along the border, which includes Toronto. We're like right close to the border. Once you head north in Canada, you're remote. And, you know, it's the same in BC. When you get away from the border, you get up north, you're remote. You get to small towns. You get to these people who actually live out there and enjoy the wilderness that you're describing. And there's ama- they are amazing people. Yeah. I mean, there's weirdos and shit. Don't get me wrong. But, like, i just give you an example. Sault Ste. Marie, the only industry there was the steel mill and the paper mill, right? And then it's jam-packed in the most incredible wilderness that in the world almost right like wasn't there a nickel mine there is that why there's the big nickel no no there that's Sudbury Sudbury is the big nickel but, oh, but, okay, but okay. like the Sioux okay. was the paper mill Sioux mills and, and, and Algoma steel right and the paper mill shut but the point is that it's in the middle of nowhere in the most pristine north yeah. of superior wilderness you drive 30 minutes out of Sault Ste. Marie and there's the mo- it's the most spectacular speckled trout fishing on the planet. Like, you know, I get my canoe on my head, and, you know, and it's me and the bears and the fish and the moose and, and there's no internet and you're on your own and that's it. And I could do that for, I could do that for months on end if if I could but I have to work you know and I don't know what it is but yeah. like for me challenging myself physically every day to a purpose of cooking and gathering a meal foraging mushrooms collecting berries catching fish it yeah I won't go into the other things we do but you know it's building an out a sauna in the woods in the middle of nowhere you know and uh and swimming naked in an ice cold pristine lake and fighting a bear off that's kicking over your crapper because he smells food and you know it's like you know there's just there's just something that makes you feel more human and and more self-sustaining than than the corporate culture that's consuming us and turning us into vapid fools right and then i get to try it's bringing it back to like our taking time to live and do the things that just require you to live spend the time doing those things versus all the bullshit that we waste our time and you go with people and everybody's subjected to having to work as a team for reals right like if someone doesn't want to yeah work as a team that one they don't get to come ever again but two you know they 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 learn skills i get to teach people stuff that they didn't know and sometimes people teach me stuff that i didn't know like a a, a knot or a way or something that i didn't know that just makes me a better person and i get to test out my clothes like i made a camp shirt and i swear to god it's the best canoeing shirt ever on the planet right and i built it for that and i'm trying to get more made but like it's just it's just outstanding this thing mosquitoes can't bite through it it's not hot it's not cold it's got all the right pockets it's got a great construction it looks cool uh you know i'm the most fuckable wilderness guy in the world in this shirt you know it's just like wow look at that (laughs) right you know, as opposed to the uh, lumber yeah. sexuals that, you know, wander around Brooklyn going, look at me, I have a beard, you know. So I think there's a sort of authenticity to really living life in this regard. I also am envious of you guys out west with your mountains and your snowboarding and your all your wonderful things. But for me, it's like go into the woods, canoe, my first aid kit my hunting fishing gear my tent and just keep moving just keep moving you know conquering a two kilometer portage in my 50s with a canoe on my head and a backpack and my knees are killing me and i'm sweating and you know i've been cut to shit from some stupid pine trees and then i have to in the rain get to a spot and set up and somehow build a fire and cook a meal and still get to sleep and then do it all again the next day. That's like, that's the greatest, most meaningful, meaningless job there is. That's like a meaningless, meaningful, <laughs> you know? It. Meaningless, meaningful. Yeah. 
You're so right. It is. It's something so great about it. And you can go to sleep that night knowing you put it all on the line and you did it and you you kept yourself alive. Yeah. You know, that so, it, there's it's you know, you say you're envious of us, but I'm envious, too. We don't have that out here. You know, our version of that is like uh backpack hiking camping yeah. right like we don't have the lakes to do the portage they're not uh, connected canoe trips yeah. so much as and I, quite yeah. frankly so i'm terrified of grizzly i'm gonna admit something i am terrified of grizzly bears i have uh one of my good friends is a west coast indigenous carver very famous guy from prince rupert and he tells me stories and i'm just like i don't want to go uh, hiking at bc <laughs> Yeah, but there's isn't there is there not grizzlies up north? No, no, in black Ontario? bears. The black bears are sweet and docile by comparison. You know, they uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. the, the sightings of grizz though is very. I've never seen one on the west coast. I've seen one once in Alberta, but they're super rare. And they don't. I get it. I get it. But like spray. you know, yeah. I encounter a black bear every summer, up close and personal. Every summer, I, I guess. I guess yeah, you guaranteed. encounter a grizzly up close a personal once and then, you know. That's <laughs> it. That's it. One time. <laughs> so you you made the camp shirt, right, which you described as this amazing piece for the wilderness, right? Now, yep, yep. do you see yourself going more into creating garments like that, maybe more adventure clothing or things that you would functionally wear out while you're in the wilderness? If I had my way, I would want to uh, replicate my favorite pieces in my personal collection. I have probably a 20,000 piece personal collection of vintage clothing. And I don't mean replicate, but like take the design elements of everything that I have. Right. I just don't have the infrastructure or the people to do it. I, I, been exploring that this year. How am I going to grow into something that I can do for another seven, eight years and then retire from and pass on a torch? So that's my goal, but I'm not sure how to do it because I see how other clothing brands operate and the scale and the amount of work that they need to do. And I really need to find a, a process that's collaborative to do that i'm just not sure where it is right because it would mean working with manufacturers so where can let's let's quickly end this on your brand where can people buy your codes how does it work uh where can people find you well the main route is uh go on my website and and if you're unsure about something just call me on my cell phone which I answer phone calls mostly during working hours. And uh, the other route is there are some stores I work with, like Free No Cloth in Los Angeles. Uh, Andrew and Matt are good friends, and uh, Clutch Cafe in London. And sometimes with Bricelands, Ethan, who has a store in Japan and in London and in Hong Kong. Um, the Thursday I was working with in Taiwan and uh, Tai Ching uh and Taipei. So um if I can put together a more price accessible line, I'll work with more stores that are friends. I I look at this as the never expanding circle of friends. I won't work with this random people. I've learned from past mistakes and uh unless I really know someone and trust them to curate my brand and curate and respect what I do, then there's no point, right? So the main the main source is Instagram and my website, and then there are a few stores that carry a few pieces. So that's that. Or Inspiration LA, where I'm going to be hanging with you guys and rowing down for yeah, three totally. days. So there you go. So, yeah. yeah, everybody, make sure you come out to Inspiration LA. Come row down, like Dave says, hang with us. Dave's going to be there. Jesse's there. I'm there. Um, all the usual suspects will be out there this weekend. Uh, make sure you guys oh, follow yeah, Dave's uh, social media. Woke yeah, Dirty Uncle that's... for his adventures and Himmelbro's Leather for his business profile and all the amazing that's leather right. production. 
That's awesome. It's really great, really great hanging, hanging out, out virtually with you, uh, Drew. That's the longest yeah. conversation I think we've ever had right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing so much knowledge. This episode is amazing. The amount of history and just valuable chats here is all time, buddy. So thank you. All right. My pleasure. I could go on forever, as you know. So uh, we'll do it again. (laughs) We'll do it again for sure. All right. Thanks, man. All right. See you this weekend. All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I hope you learned something because I sure as hell did. Dave has a lot of knowledge to share and I appreciate him for coming on and doing that again. If you want to check out our jackets, hit us up on IG if they haven't already sold that inspiration. I'm recording this right now before inspiration, so I don't know if they're going to sell. But if they haven't, you can hit us up and check out those jackets. Um, Check out a previous episode for more info on the jacket collab, because we do talk about it a bit in this episode. I don't really even know how inspiration goes, so I'm recording this pre-inspiration. So hopefully we sold everything at the show. Also, don't forget, check out fsandfrankvintage.com. Grab some gear. It supports the show. Check out the Patreon, guys. Um, It just really helps me do what I got to do here. Keep this thing going and uh, check out the Jam app. You can search all the vintage you need in one place. You don't have to go to all the different sites. Jam app allows you to search sites like eBay, Poshmark, Etsy, Grail, all from one hub. You can set up auto searches and notifications. Just go check out the Jam app because they support the show, guys. They support the show. Check out Easy and Bid Stitch. They also support the show. So... Thanks, and uh, see you guys next week for another episode of Vintage and Stuff.